Hello, everybody. Dr. Machino here. Welcome to another lunchtime webinar on Tuesday, February the 9th. Sorry, I'm missing something. Sorry about that. This. This. Great. Okay. Perfect. We're ready to go. So thanks for tuning in. And uh, we'll get started. I'm going to have to move at a fairly quick pace to try to stay on time today. Uh, so I'll give you the, uh, the highlight overview here as we go through this. Uh, and I'll make sure these slides are made available so you have access to them after the webinar today. So again, thanks for attending. Let's go through this and have some fun. Of course, you know, osteoarthritis, for those of you who are chiropractors listening in, this is right in sort of the part of the core type of practice or patients that we see. Sometimes we forget, you know, when you're looking at macroscopically, you're looking at their joints and their muscles and, you know, range of motion and so on, that on a cellular level, there's some very important events that are going on where nutritional medicine could be a nice adjunct to the prevention and management of these conditions. And I wanna show you the evidence for that uh, today. So let's start with this. Of course, osteoarthritis is a very common problem in humans. As people get older, the incidence is increases. You know, virtually everyone by the age of 75, but I will tell you that it doesn't have to be this way. Uh, even though genetics play a factor, as well as the aging process, there are things that we can do to counter sort of the genetic time bombs of aging that lead to osteoarthritis, as I sort of alluded to in one of the previous webinars. So there are things that we can do to help people to prevent suffering from this condition because, you know, as people get older, having constant joint pain and immobility caused by osteoarthritis is a major factor in terms of uh, compromised quality of life. So part of our job really is to help slow the process down, reverse it where we can and help to prevent this from being a, a major disabling outcome from the aging process as best we can. So the study suggests that this can be done. And of course, I like to talk about the role of glucosamine because as we get older, the body synthesizes less glucosamine and this becomes a major factor in allowing joint cartilage erosion to occur. And then you also get an inflammatory component. And the inflammatory component, a lot of this comes from the fact that white blood cells called monocytes actually reside on the inner lining of the synovial membrane. And as we get older, they, they tend to morph into macrophages and produce inflammatory uh, prostaglandins and cytokines. And there are things that we can do to, to tone that down as well as we're going to uh, look at. But the first thing I want to just review with you again is that as we get older, after the age of 40, everyone to a greater or lesser degree decreases the ability of their chondrocytes to form important cartilaginous material. And that's because less glucosamine is then, or less glucose is converted to glucosamine by the enzyme, the fructose 6-amide transferase. So what results with that is over time, the cartilage that you have is now breaking down at a faster rate than you can synthesize it. And we start getting joint cartilage erosion coupled with increased inflammatory prostaglandins and cytokines being secreted by the uh, monocytes in the joint capsule, which produces, produces inflammation and further degradation of the joint cartilage. And so you go from these healthy looking joints and then, you know, at some point down the road, you're looking at knees that look like this, where the, the joint space is really compromised. And the thing is you want to be showing your patients along the way what they can do to prevent that or slow this process down as best as possible. There are no drugs that can do it. It really comes down to nutritional medicine and exercise and the kinds of chiropractic work you do to keep the joints aligned as best as possible and, and functioning normally. So when we look at chondrocytes, chondrocytes in the joint cartilage are taking glucose out of the bloodstream and they use it for energy and to make DNA and RNA, just like all the other cells. But then there's this hexosamine biosynthetic pathway where some of the glucose gets converted into glucosamine and then into other components here that are going to be important, sort of the mortar 
within the joint cartilage comes from these components. And so as we get older, after the age of 40 especially, the conversion of glucose down this pathway to glucosamine becomes compromised because after the age of 40, to a greater or lesser degree in just about everybody, this enzyme, the fructose 6-amide transferase enzyme, it becomes much more sluggish as part of just the aging process. It's built into the body's aging clock. So now you're making less glucosamine. Now, glucosamine, once it's made in the chondrocyte, normally gets acetylated to N-acetylglucosamine. And that is N-acetylglucosamine then is required to make hyaluronic acid. A very important part of the synovial fluid is hyaluronic acid. It gives viscosity and shock absorbing properties to the synovial fluid. And then some of that N-acetylglucosamine becomes N-acetylgalactosamine. And that becomes a very important unit to make chondroitin sulfate. So chondroitin sulfate looks like this. It's that N-acetylgalactosamine attached to glucuronic acid, this disaccharide molecule. And then when you have a, those di disaccharide, here's the chondroitin sulfate disaccharide, it gets attached in a very long chain. And that long chain becomes the chondroitin sulfate that's inside your joint cartilage. So if you stop making optimal amounts of glucosamine after the age of 40, over time, you can't make chondroitin sulfate the same way to the same degree. So the rate at which it breaks down is faster than the rate that you can synthesize it. And you start to get cartilage erosion and joint space narrowing. That's where that comes from. So chondroitin sulfate is made from this molecule, N-acetylgalactosamine, and you need to make glucosamine first to make it. It's the mortar between the bricks, as we're going to see, and it has a sort of bottle brush appearance. So here, if we go inside the joint cartilage, we see here's the collagen fibers going across. They're like beams and also elastin fibers would kind of look this way. They are the beams inside the joint cartilage. And then you have hyaluronic acid. Remember you need glucosamine to make that hyaluronic acid and everything. So the, and so you have the chondroitin stem sticking to it. So here you have this chondroitin sulfate molecule. You have this stem, which is a series of amino acids, serine residues primarily. Then the chondroitin are these little uh, like it's like a bottle brush and the bristles of the bottle brush are the chondroitin sulfate. So you see the chondroitin sulfate is sort of the mortar between the collagen fibers. It's the mortar between those beams that maintains the joint cartilage uh, integrity and dynamics and structure. And also the, the chondroitin sulfate is acting to pull water into the cartilage to hydrate it to help give it shock absorbing properties. So as you get older, if you stop making that chondroitin sulfate optimally as occurs because you can't make the glucosamine component to make N-acetylgalactosamine and hyaluronic hydration of the cartilage, which makes it more brittle and less pliable, less of a shock absorbing material. And you get joint cartilage erosion over time. You get the loss of the joint space, advanced osteoarthritis, people needing knee replacement surgery when it probably could have been avoided in most cases. So we see that the studies with uh, glucosamine, I'm going to show you the references here in a moment, but when you swallow, so the, I, the thinking was over the years in starting in the 1980s, if the, con, if the chondrocytes can't make uh, glucosamine optimally for themselves as they get old, as you get older, if you take glucosamine supplementation, can that then go to the chondrocyte and substitute for the glucosamine that the chondrocyte is not making for itself anymore? So you can continue to make chondroitin sulfate. So you can continue to make hyaluronic acid. And the evidence very strongly suggests that yes, that's very possible. So when, they, when you break down the studies, you see that when you swallow the 8% of it gets absorbed into the bloodstream. Then it, of course it has, it goes through the liver almost right away as it gets shunted by the blood vessels from the gut to the liver. And a, a significant percentage of glucosamine gets metabolized right away and, and uh, is converted into end products of metabolism that the body cannot use. But 26% of it goes through the liver and stay, comes out the other side in a form that the chondrocytes can pick up and use as a source of glucosamine to make N-acetylgalactosamine so they can make chondroitin sulfate the way you did when you were younger and also make hyaluronic acid for more shock absorbing properties. What you're going to see is that glucosamine also has some very significant anti-inflammatory effects. Now, can you just swallow chondroitin sulfate? Well, you can, but chondroitin sulfate is a very, very large molecule. Very little of it, very little of it actually gets absorbed and gets into the bloodstream because it's too large. And a lot of it gets chopped down and it releases the sulfur. The sulfur has some anti-inflammatory properties, but 
it's far better to take glucosamine to synthesize your body's own chondro chondroitin sulfate. Swallow. There's no evidence to show that the chondroitin sulfate you swallow becomes chondroitin sulfate in your joints. But there have been many studies showing that glucosamine is a very viable product to help the body make its own chondroitin sulfate. Over 20 or 25 years of experience, 70 countries doing studies on this. It's been shown to, not in every case, because it doesn't work for every single person, but it works in a high percentage of cases, especially if you have sort of a mild to moderate osteoarthritic changes, it's going to be helpful. Once it becomes really advanced, you know, to some degree it's too late. So you have to sort of nip this in the bud and use it even as a preventative strategy. What you want to do, because the studies show you can slow and halt cartilage erosion, which is critically important. And because glucosamine has anti-inflammatory properties, it also decreases pain, swelling, and stiffness. I'll show you the research on that and how it does that. It also increases hyaluronic acid synthesis, and it can stimulate more collagen synthesis as well from fibroblasts. And of course, exercise does that too. And in head-to-head -head studies against non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, glucosamine sulfate often performs equally as well. It takes longer for glucosamine to work. Glucosamine can take up to 12 weeks before you start to feel the benefit. Whereas if a person takes aspirin or ibuprofen, they feel improvement the same day. But those drugs aren't actually changing the pathophysiological process of the disease, whereas glucosamine is actually addressing the, the underlying problem, which is you know uh, joint cartilage erosion and the inflammatory process that is triggered by lack of glucosamine. So, you know, glucosamine also has uh, fewer side effects than non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and the side effects are less severe. We'll get to that later. And just so you know, it really is only glucosamine sulfate, that form of glucosamine that has sort of the gold standard credibility behind it. Sometimes you see other forms of glucosamine but the, the number of studies and the overall clinical efficacy has not been shown to be at the same gold standard level as glucosamine sulfate. And because glucosamine sulfate contains sulfur, the sulfur has also anti-inflammatory effects itself and supports connective tissue. So you're getting the, the secondary benefit when you have glucosamine sulfate because that implies that there's sulfur molecules. So there's been a few recent studies of great importance. The 2012 review in the therapeutic advances in medicine, where medical doctors, this is in Italy now, where glucosamine is a prescription drug, medical doctors saying to other medical doctors, this is the product you should be using with every osteoarthritic patient, because not only does it help to slow down destruction of joint cartilage, but it also decreases the release of inflammatory chemicals that actually amplify the osteoarthritic process. And those inflammatory chemicals are nuclear factor kappa beta and interleukin-1. So what does that mean? It means this, that inside all the cells of your body, but right now let's go into the monocytes. Let's say this is a, a, a monocyte, that this large cell that's sort of residing on the inner uh, membrane of your synovial joints. Here's nuclear factor kappa beta. It's a peptide that normally is just sitting there dormant because it's sequestered by this, what's called the inhibitor of nuclear factor kappa beta. It just, it's in the cytoplasm and it just stays there. But upon activation by a stimulation, nuclear factor kappa beta then translocates to the nucleus and it stimulates genes that produce a lot of inflammatory cytokines. So here's what it looks like. When certain uh, agents, when the monocyte gets stimulated, it tends to activate nuclear factor kappa beta, it gets released from the inhibitor, it travels to the nucleus and it stimulates the release and synthesis of in white blood cells of inflammatory cytokines, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and this monocyte chemotaxis protein, which really just brings more white blood cells to the area and stimulates them to produce more inflammatory cytokines. So glucosamine doesn't just help stop the joint cartilage erosion. It's inhibiting this really diabolical step that occurs in the aging process as well within monocytes where the nuclear factor kappa beta goes to the nucleus and stimulates the release of all these inflammatory cytokines. So this is a huge, huge intervention to help block that process. So it was, all of this was reviewed again in 2019 in seminars in arthritis and rheumatism. I would suggest strongly that you read this review paper. It shows that glucosamine sulfate has the ability, has shown this in humans, to delay the need for total joint replacement surgery. 
So it'd be very nice if you could work with your patients so that over time, if you're managing their case, that they don't at some point need to have hip replacement surgery or knee replacement surgery. These are major quality of life changing events, but if, if they're needed, they're needed. You want to try to prevent that. Only glucosamine sulfate, not, not other forms of glucosamine, have this disease modifying profile being consistent, consistently effective in knee osteoarthritis, physical function, uh, joint structural changes, affecting all of these parameters. And then back to the 2012 study again by Rovati, talking about the cartilage building effect, decreasing interleukin-1, decreasing the release of nuclear factor kappa beta. And it's only the stabilized form of glucosamine sulfate that actually has these effects. The other types of glucosamine have not shown the gold standard evidence that you see with glucosamine sulfate. Now the dose is important because you think that you have to give glucosamine you know, 500 milligrams three times a day, but really in the medical literature, it shows that the person can take all 1500 milligrams of glucosamine all at once. And the reason I think that's important is from a compliance standpoint. It's hard to get someone to do something, you know, uh, one dose three times a day. They forget, it becomes a, a, an inconvenience. So they can take all 1500 milligrams of glucosamine at one time with food. And that's been shown to, uh, it's relevant to the improvement of pain and function and decreasing symptomatology in arthritic conditions. And studies showing this, Continuous administration for three years resulted in significant reduction in the progression of joint structure changes compared with placebo as assessed by measuring radiologic joint space narrowing. In other words, in a study published in Lancet by Reginster, they took osteoarthritic patients that had knee osteoarthritis. And so they already had OA to begin with. Beginning of the study, they gave half the group glucosamine sulfate, 1,500 milligrams one time a day with food. And the other group got the placebo, randomized double blind study. Three years later, they re, they re x ray their knees and they see the group that got the glucosamine, no further joint cartilage destruction. And their mobility was better, their inflammation was better, their pain was less, they were able to walk faster because it's also reducing the inflammatory process as well. And as you can see, that these effects by decreasing inflammation, stabilizing joint cartilage, leads to a decreased uh, uh, requirement for these individuals having to undergo joint replacement surgery compared to the group that's, that's getting the placebo. So did it help every single patient in the study? No, but it helped a significant percentage of them. And there are no drugs that can do this. There are no drugs that can do this. Has a very good safety profile. Again, it's 1500 milligrams once a day. And when you do that, the studies show in humans, it, you actually see a rise in the plasma concentrations of glucosamine. You see a rise in the synovial fluid concentration. So it's not just smoke and mirrors where the person just has some placebo effect. Objectively, you actually see an increase of the, uh, these changes as well as decreased inflammatory cytokines in their bloodstream. On x-ray, you see decreased uh, joint cartilage erosion. So there are some side effects that can happen with glucosamine sulfate. If you know, usually this is related to not taking it with enough food at one time. A person has a cracker and they take glucosamine. You know, it might upset your stomach. Some people get drowsy. Anybody can be sensitive to anything. It can produce a skin rash or headaches. I mean, you know, you know, with anything, people can be sensitive to almost anything. It's impossible to predict, but it's usually very, very rare and, and very infrequent. Of note, though, is that if someone is prone to high blood pressure, glucosamine sulfate and other forms of glucosamine may actually cause blood pressure to rise a little for a reason no one can actually explain. So if someone's a high blood pressure patient, just make sure they monitor their blood pressure a little more closely in the early days of taking glucosamine. Usually it doesn't raise their, their blood pressure, but it can. Also, if a person has diabetes or prediabetes, in some cases it's not that common, but it can produce a little more insulin resistance and their blood sugar might start to rise a bit. So in these individuals, if you see that trend, then maybe they're just not a candidate for glucosamine. But these side effects are pretty minor compared to those from non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin, ibuprofen, um, uh, Voltaren or diclofenac, uh, indomethacin. These things of course cause GI bleeding and erosion 
They cause 10 to 20,000 deaths from bleeding alone in the United States every year. Now they're showing that it increased, they increase risk of congestive heart failure. Acetaminophen especially can damage the liver. Of all the drugs uh, that cause liver failure, acetaminophen like in Tylenol is the leading drug that actually causes liver failure in individuals. And 50% of those occur in people just taking acetaminophen at the recommended amount. And drugs like aspirin and ibuprofen can cause uh, what's called renal um, uh, analgesic nephropathy, where you get chronic, it causes kidney disease. So medical doctors are told that in patients who have any kind of congestive heart failure problem already, any liver damage, any chronic kidney decline, any previously of ulceration in their gut, then they can't take non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. That's a lot of older patients that have those, those uh, comorbidity issues. So, but these people can take glucosamine and the natural anti-inflammatories I'm gonna show you. Other concerns with glucosamine is that some people will think they can't take glucosamine sulfate because they have a sulfa allergy. When, in that instance, they're talking about sulfamide compounds. So sulfamides are different than glucosamine sulfate. Glucosamine sulfate means that the glucosamine is attached to the mineral sulfur. Nobody can be allergic to sulfur. You have sulfur in every cell in your body, but you can be highly, deathly allergic to sul sulfamide compounds, which are certain kind of antibiotics back in the old days, as well as certain preservatives. So, but these people with those allergies can take glucosamine sulfate. However, glucosamine the, the origin of glucosamine is it is mined from the exoskeleton of shellfish. And the glucosamine sulfate that we have that's available uh, in, you know, in this part of the world is a sort of a pure grade pharmaceutical type grade of glucosamine where it doesn't have any antigens from the shellfish. But I have heard of reports of people who have a shellfish allergy that's very severe actually reacting to glucosamine where they break out in a rash or they start to wheeze a little bit. No one has had an anaphylactic shock, but to me, that's, that's something that's of great concern. So I would say someone who has a severe shellfish allergy or seafood allergy, you might wanna be cautious in your recommendations around glucosamine with these individuals. Of course, if they're a diabetic or pre-diabetic, just have them monitor their blood sugar a little more closely in the first few weeks. The same is true for people that have high blood pressure, they're being treated for high blood pressure. So to really manage osteoarthritis from a nutritional medicine standpoint, you also want to decrease, you want to make, try to encourage them to be on an anti-inflammatory diet. This is very hard to do. It means giving up all high fat meat products, high fat dairy products, having more fish, fruit, vegetables, legumes, because this will help to downregulate the signals to the monocytes so they don't secrete as many inflammatory cytokines and prostaglandins. We'll, we'll get into that in a moment. But I really like combining glucosamine sulfate with other natural anti-inflammatories like MSM and quercetin and bromelain. You'll see some of the evidence here in 2018 in the journals of orthopedic surgery research. And remember that chondroitin sulfate supplements, like a lot of companies combine glucosamine with chondroitin. And the evidence shows, if you want to read this research paper, that it, chondroitin really might just be a waste of money because very little of it is getting absorbed. Most of it is being chopped into pieces by the digestive enzymes. Some sulfur gets released because it's chondroitin sulfate, and that might have an anti-inflammatory effect. But I really think you're better off to combine glucosamine with MSM and quercetin and bromelain, and I will show you why. So let's start with MSM. There was originally just experimental evidence on MSM. There are now, you know, human clinical studies that have been done. But in the beginning, we saw that uh, anecdotally, MSM was helping people with sort of joint cartilage and osteoarthritic complaints. In 2009, they started doing these more uh, experimental investigations, showing that it can decrease the synthesis of uh, inflammatory prostaglandins and like glucosamine, decrease interleukins and, and also nuclear factor kappa beta. And it can sort of block the trigger on the monocyte surface, which is tumor necrosis factor alpha that actually triggers nuclear factor kappa beta to go to the nucleus. So it's inhibiting all these really key switches inside the monocyte. So it, uh, it, MSM is a very sulfur rich compound. And that's what I like about it is because sulfur has these great anti-inflammatory effects, including decreasing synthesis of prostaglandins uh, that produce inflammation like, like uh, these enzymes cyclooxygenase. So we have this animal evidence to show that it's working 
on an experimental level, decreasing inflammatory interleukins, toning down nuclear factor kappa beta and uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha. All these things are critically important to decreasing the inflammatory process from the monocytes within the joint synovial capsule. Even topically, when it was applied, it could help to decrease uh, edema in animal studies. So collectively, they're saying, you know, there's evidence to support the anecdotal studies or the anecdotal, the anecdotal reports they had saying MSM has these anti-inflammatory uh, influences on these sort of monocytes or macrophages that are part of the joint synovial lining. And the sulfur has anti-inflammatory effects, and we've seen a lot of reports that it seems to be helpful, especially in combined with glucosamine. But then in 2017, we started to see uh, greater uh, evidence for this. So you see, uh, yeah, it's been well been investigated in animal studies, as well as in human clinical trials and experiments, which I will show you. A variety of health-specific outcome measures improved MSM supplementation, including reducing inflammation and improving joint and muscle pain. It also has uh, antioxidant properties, which are nice. In vitro studies indicate that MSM inhibits uh, you know, nuclear factor kappa beta, which we've talked about. And here are the human studies. Dr. Stanley Jacob references 11 case studies of patients suffering from osteoarthritis who experienced improved symptoms following supplementation with MSM. Clinical trials suggest that MSM is effective in reducing pain as indicated by the visual analog pain score, the WOMAC pain uh, subscale, and as well as other indices. Concurrent improvements were also noted in stiffness, swelling. Furthermore, in a study conducted by Usha and Nadu, MSM in combination with glucosamine potentiated the improvements in pain, pain intensity, and swelling. I love the combination of MSM and glucosamine together. And then there's quercetin. So experimentally, we've seen that quercetin modulates pain by, by decreasing the, act, the synthesis of, of these inflammatory prostaglandins by inhibiting cyclooxygenase and lipoxygenase, which we were gonna, we'll see shortly. In preclinical in vitro studies, uh, quercetin showed significant reduction levels in inflammatory mediators and including decreasing C-reactive protein, that's a very important biomarker of, of inflammation in the body is C-reactive protein. And then you have this rat study, which is just 80 milligram dose, inhibiting these inflammatory uh, mediators and helping to improve arthritic symptoms. But then we have human studies as well in recent years from Ascari showing that uh, two month uh, study of uh, quercetin 500 milligrams in healthy male non-professional athletes doing regular exercise compared to the placebo group. The study showed a significant decrease in blood levels of C-reactive protein. I worked with a rheumatologist here in Toronto for a couple of years and she would send me some of her more complicated patients that had autoimmune diseases, especially with there is joint involvement. And she said, the most important thing I want to see is, are you able to further reduce the C-reactive protein or the CRP? If you can do that, then I know it's not just a placebo effect in the patient. They, they truly are seeing, getting objective improvement in the biomarkers that I'm following most closely. So quercetin has been shown to decrease CRP uh, levels in, in athletes who are training hard. It also inhibits uh, the exanthine oxidase, so it can decrease the buildup of uric acid. That might be helpful in patients that have gout. Here's a randomized study, eight-week study, four groups giving uh, either quercetin by itself or vitamin C by itself or quercetin, vitamin C, or they're getting a placebo. And the eight-week study showed the group that got the quercetin with the vitamin C showed a very significant reduction in inflammatory biomarkers, including C-reactive protein and also interleukin-6, which is also a major inflammatory interleukin released by monocytes in the uh, joint synovial membrane. So here's where tumor necrosis factor, here's where TNF, tumor ne necrosis factor alpha comes in. It's TNF that stimulates the TNF receptor on the monocyte. And then through this um, signal transduction pathway, you see it go to nuclear factor kappa beta, and that's what releases it. It goes to the, uh, the nucleus of the cell, and then you get the upregulation and synthesis of those inflammatory interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and so on. So by inhibiting tumor necrosis factor alpha, that's absolutely huge, absolutely huge. So when you look at quercetin, all the different anti-inflammatory effects it has, inhibiting nuclear factor kappa beta, inhibiting inflammatory cytokines and inhibiting the release of all kinds of, uh, of uh, 
inflammatory interleukins. This is, cri this is critical. And it has these effects on also toning down inflammation from other immune cells in the neighborhood. So you don't have drugs that can do this without producing side effects. That's what I'm saying. So glu glucosamine with MSM, with quercetin, you start to get these incredible effects on the receptor on the monocyte, which would be uh, the nuclear factor kappa beta receptor, and then inhibiting the release of nuclear factor kappa beta, and then uh, decreasing the release of the inflammatory cytokines that would be associated with that. So these three things sort of working synergistically to help tame this process, which is critical. I also like the addition of bromelain enzymes. You know, the bromelain are these uh, digest, these uh, uh, protein digesting enzymes found in the stem of the pineapple plant. Uh, in vitro and in, in vivo studies have shown many anti-inflammatory activities, including in humans as well. The body absorbs bromelain extremely well and it maintains their proteolytic activity without any major side effects. It's been shown to relieve osteoarthritis and some other conditions where it may have show some benefit as well. But this 2016 review, I thought was really important uh, where you have uh, clinical studies with, with human patients with knee osteoarthritis showing the ones given the bromelain decreased uh, pain and stiffness of the osteoarthritic knee. Another clinical study here uh, administered to patients with arthritic joint swelling significant to complete and decreased soft tissue swelling was observed. So these people also saw decreased uh, infl inflammation and edema in their inflamed joints in patients that had uh, uh, arthritic joints. So you have actual, in recent years, more and more human clinical studies, placebo controlled. You can click on these links and, and read about the studies with uh, MSM and quercetin and bromelain. So, you know, this was, this sort of justifies the Adiva uh, glucosamine joint formula that I produced over the years. I, I've, I've changed ingredients in it over the years as the, as the research uh, moved around, I changed some of the anti-inflammatory components. But right now it's glucosamine sulfate with MSM and quercetin and bromelain. What I'm saying is that because these age-related changes are going to occur in the joints, you know, you'd, I don't think you should wait for osteoarthritis to start surfacing before you start acting on it sort of preventatively. So back in my early 40s, I started to take just one capsule a day myself. And now that I'm gonna be 67 in a couple of months, I'm very happy that I did because my joint cartilage is extremely well maintained. I can still run, I can still lift weights, I can still skate, I can hit, run around a tennis court if I want to. I don't have arthritic knees and ankles and hips. And, and you know, uh, I recently had a, 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 low, a lumbar X-ray done and I have some disc bulging because I've I've lifted weights too heavy, but my joint cartilage is extremely intact. I don't have joint facet uh, advanced arthritic changes. So I'm glad I've done that. If the person has osteoarthritis, they're taking three capsules per day with food. So they, they take it all at once. If they weigh over 200 pounds, they should be taking four capsules a day. If they're on a diuretic drug, they're going to need four capsules a day because they're washing it out at a faster rate. Health Canada allows us to make this claim because we've been able to show evidence to Health Canada to justify the claim. That it says helps to relieve joint pain associated with osteoarthritis, because it does. Helps to protect against deterioration of joint cartilage, because it does. And there's nothing else that can do those things. There are no drugs that can do it. So this is really is, uh, should be a main staple in the prevention and management of osteoarthritic conditions if you're seeing musculoskeletal patients. The story, of course, doesn't end there. There's also the whole inflammatory story that also involves polyunsaturated fats. So as you likely know, when you, when you consume the fats that you eat, some of those fats get incorporated into the membrane around all the cells of your body. They get incorporated into the phospholipids. And every five to 10, five to 15 minutes of your life, life phospholipids, um, there's an enzyme called phospholipase A2 that releases some of those, those uh, fats and they become prostaglandins. Some of those prostaglandins like prostaglandin series two promote the inflammatory process especially the, uh, the fatty acid, arachidonic acid, which is a polyunsaturated fat that you can especially get from meat products. And that's gonna produce more inflammation and it's gonna activate more nuclear factor kappa beta to go to the nucleus and produce all those inflammatory interleukins. 
So it's not just about glucosamine and anti-inflammatories. You have to also have the right intake of essential fatty acids. Whereas prostaglandin series one and three that you make from you know fish oil and flaxseed oil and borash seed oil, they tend to have an anti-inflammatory effect. And I'm going to show you the studies on this in humans. So what the person's eating and the supplements they're taking around the types of fats they consume also play an important role. So here you see the phospholipids in the, in the cell membrane of all the cells in your body, but including, you know, immune cells uh, like monocytes. So the uh, phospholipid is made with a, uh, a glycerol backbone, right? These three carbons here. And there's from, the, from your diet, it's going to take different fatty acids that you eat. It's going to attach it to the, to the glycerol backbone. Then it's going to have a phosphate group like choline or serine or inositol. And you're going to have a, a phospholipid. Now, it depends. So the types of fats that you eat decide what kind of fats are going to be attached to these to the cell membrane in all your cells. And unfortunately, what happens is a lot of people consume a lot of high fat animal products. So they have a lot of arachidonic acid in their phospholipid structure. And every five to 15 minutes, the phospholipase A2 releases that arachidonic acid. So he releases it. Here's phospholipase A2 releasing it. The arachidonic acid then is converted by cyclooxygenase into prostaglandin series two inflammatory uh, prostaglandins. So they, that produces inflammation, but it gets worse because this prostaglandin series two also then stimulates the monocyte to produce more to release more nuclear factor kappa beta to go to the nucleus and produce more inflammatory interleukins. So it doesn't just end here. And in white blood cells like monocytes, it also travels through the lipoxygenase enzyme to form leukotriene B4, which is also very inflammatory. In, rheumatoid, in patients that have autoimmune diseases, this, this pathway along the lipoxygenase pathway is tremendously upregulated. That's why there's even more inflammation in people that have sort of rheumatoid arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis and those types of things. So remember that the monocytes differentiate into osteoclasts and the microglia in the brain, Kupfer cells in the liver, the Langerhans cells in the skin, and you have alveolar macrophages, right? But some of these uh, also go and are aligned, are, they're, they're part of the lining of your synovial joints as well. They, these monocytes go everywhere. And then they morph into macrophages that produce a lot of inflammation, especially as you get older. So there's, uh, once that macrophage is activated, it's producing all kinds of inflammatory molecules. Um, and uh, even the aging process is just part of the, the age-related activation to produce it. So you wanna try to tame that macrophage as best you can. And one of the ways to tame it is to make sure that the person's not feeding themselves all kinds of arachidonic acid because that will then through cyclooxygenase become the series two prostaglandins and through the lipoxygenase enzyme become leukotriene B4. That produces even more inflammation. That, that, puts, that amplifies the inflammatory cascade. Whereas if the person's getting eicosampantanoic acid from fish and fish oil, then the same enzyme cyclooxygenase converts it into prostaglandin series three, which is anti-inflammatory. The same enzyme converts it via lipoxygenase into series five, which is also anti-inflammatory. So this becomes sort of this balancing act inside your body. If I have more of those omega-3 fats to tone down inflammation, I get an anti-inflammatory effect. If I'm consuming more of the arachidonic acid foods, I'm going to outweigh that and produce a greater inflammatory effect. So on a large scale, it looks like this. Here's the arachidonic acid producing prostaglandin series two and leukotriene B4 uh, over here. Now let's back up a little bit. If you overconsume certain vegetable oils like corn oil, sunflower seed oil, safflower seed oil, that linoleic acid, the over, when you consume a, more of it, and most people consume more of that type of uh, linoleic acid than the body needs, it'll convert it into arachidonic acid. So you end up with even more arachidonic acid. That's why it's better to have olive oil and uh, even canola oil as, uh, and flaxseed oil, of course so that you don't have too much linoleic acid to become uh, arachidonic acid. So at the same time as this is happening, this is alpha linolenic acid from flaxseed oil. And notice it can be elongated to eicosam EPA, the fish oil, eicosampantanoic acid, even into DHA, right? Docosahexanoic acid. 
And while it's doing that, it's stealing the enzymes that would normally build up arachidonic. It's stealing those enzymes away so that you, you decrease the amount of arachidonic acid you build up. So as much as I think people should have a fish oil supplement and eat fish a couple of times a week to get EPA and DHA, having flaxseed oil as well helps the body make more EPA and slow down the process to arachidonic acid. Now at this particular step, dihomogammalinolenic acid, a detour can occur where you form prostaglandin series one, which is also very anti-inflammatory. To make that pathway work, you need vitamin C and vitamin E and B vitamins and magnesium and zinc. So a high potency, if you take the right essential fatty acids, flax seed oil with fish oil, with borage seed oil to, 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 to make this conversion work, Borash seed oil is very high in GLA, gamma linolenic acid. From there, you're just one step away from making this prostaglandin series one. But you also need a high potency multivitamin to, to create the oxidative stress that would move this uh, to form more prostaglandin series one. So looking at it in a different way now, here's the flax seed oil, alpha linolenic acid coming down to, ICO, to EPA which is the fish oil becoming prostaglandin series three. And DHA can also backtrack, but DHA also has its own effects on the brain and on the, on the eye, on the retina. That's very critical for memory and, and brain development and, and brain preservation, preventing Alzheimer's disease. So both EPA and DHA are important for their own purposes. And here you have arachidonic acid becoming prostaglandin series two and the linoleic acid, corn oil, sunflower seed oil also do. Here's, here's the the uh, dihomogammalinolenic acid becoming prostaglandin series one. So this is very well established. Once again, the, you would like to get your dihomogammalinolenic acid rather than forming arachidonic acid, going this route to form prostaglandin series one. And in order to do that, you need to have the right environment. You need antioxidants and B6 and zinc and magnesium. And that's why using the Adiva high potency multivitamin with the essential fatty acids is going to give you the best possible outcome in terms of prostaglandin synthesis. Just to remind you what some of these structures look like, here's alpha linolenic acid from flaxseed oil. The methyl end is also called the uh, omega end. So if I count three carbons from the omega end, one, two, three, that's where I see the first double bond. That's how something becomes an omega-3 fat. It's where does the first double bond occur? Of course, the other end is the carboxylic end. Now, if I elongate that, right, to 20 car from 18 carbons to 20 carbons, I now have EPA eicosampantanoic acid found in fish oil. So it's just, and I have enzymes that can do that. And I can also ingest fish or fish oil. And I will also get this beautiful omega-3 fat that is the, pre, the immediate precursor to make prostaglandin series three. I can be further elongated to docosahexanoic acid, right, DHA, which is just a little bit longer. It's 22 carbons long. But again, the first double bond occurs at, at the third and fourth carbon, that's why it's an omega-3 fat. Whereas linoleic acid, notice it's one, two, three, four, five, so it's a omega-6, right? Six, if at the six carbon from the methyl end or the omega end is where I get the first double bond, that's how it's named. So linoleic acid can be elongated to arachidonic acid, also an omega-6 fat, and arachidonic acid is the precursor to the inflammatory prostaglandins. And then you see, just I thought I'd show you some of those saturated fats, because some of these saturated fats like myristic acid and palmitic acid, lauric acid, they actually will produce inflammation by stimulating on macrophages a receptor called the toll-like receptor 4. And when it's stimulated by sat these saturated fats, you also increase the inflammatory interleukins being released by monocytes. So it's not just the, the polyunsaturated fats that play a role. We'll see this later on in the presentation. So just to recap for you, the polyunsaturated fat, there are polyunsaturated fats in the diet that the body can put into the cell membrane. And from there, those, fat, those fats become prostaglandins, either prostaglandin 1, 2, or 3. Unfortunately, arachidonic acid from high fat meat products produces prostaglandin series two, promoting inflammation and other problems and also makes your platelets sticky, increasing risk of heart disease. So you see a lot of arachidonic acid in red meat and pork, but if you overconsume these vegetable oils, you're gonna end up with too much linoleic acid. The body will slowly convert some of that also into arachidonic acid. You're much better to use olive oil, canola oil. If you're gonna stir fry, maybe peanut oil. And here's some evidence uh, for that. 
In contrast to prostaglandin series one or to prostaglandin series two, which is bad, you want to make prostaglandin series one and three because they have anti-inflammatory effects that also make your skin nice and smooth and soft if you're interested in that. And they have other anti-heart disease effects and anti-cancer effects. So I formulated this for a diva. It's a diva in nature's essential oils. If you haven't seen it, it's a high yield fish oil. 50% of the oil is EPA and DHA. Flaxseed oil, 57% alpha linolenic acid and borage seed is 22% gamma linolenic acid. These three things working together to optimize the types of anti-inflammatory prostaglandins that you want to be study, you want to be using. Is there any evidence to support that this actually occurs in humans? There's lots of it. And most of the studies have been done to people that have rheumatoid arthritis, by the way, because that's a more severe form of arthritis. So here's a review of 10 randomized control studies involving 183 rheumatoid arthritic patients, 187 were placebo and 187 placebo treated in the meta-analysis. The analysis showed that omega-3 supplements clearly reduced non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug consumption. In other words, as they, the longer they stayed on the omega-3 fat supplement, the fewer other anti-inflammatory drugs they needed. Most arthritic patients would welcome that because their drugs have horrible side effects. Decreased tender joints, decreased swollen joints, less morning stiffness. The conclusion was that when you get to a specific dosage of omega-3 fats, even just after three months, you start to see a reduction in the need for non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. This is unbelievable. Then in 2016, all that evidence, uh, a lot of early evidence was reported by Lee and follows. You might want to read his research paper and shows, of course, that omega-3 fat intake leads to reduced arachidonic acid in the cell membrane. Isn't that amazing? Everything you think it's going to do is exactly what happens. And it decreases inflammatory markers like tumor necrosis factor alpha. It's exactly what you want it to do. Moreover, the diet's omega-3 fats leads to redu reduced production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. There they are. And also decreased cartilage degrading enzymes because the monocytes also, when they're upregulated, up some of the interleukins actually stimulate the destruction of joint cartilage. And all of this is mitigated by the consumption of omega-3 fats via supplementation. So this 12-week study now that they're referring to of 49 newly diagnosed rheumatoid arthritic patients, uh, they were also under standard medications, but the group that got the, sent the EPA, these, that should say EPA, not EFA, eicosampantanoic acid and DHA, here's what they show, here's what happened after three months. The group got the omega-3 fats, less morning stiffness, right? So the stiffness lasted a much uh, a shorter period of time. The average number of swollen joints from 21 down to five, number of swollen joints dropped from 10 to three. These were tender joints, these were swollen joints. The ESR, the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, another key marker for inflammation, goes from 39 down to 16, right? The drugs alone couldn't do that. The doctors assessing the patient said there's notable change in the pain and function. It didn't have any effect on making them lose weight or become anorexic or, uh, you know, have a, any kind of adverse effect. And their use of analgesics decreased tremendously. So a lot of these people were able to go off all of their analgesic medication after just three months. I mean, this is incredible. These are rheumatoid arthritic patients. This isn't just your garden variety. I've got some osteoarthritic changes. Then in 2020, we did uh, a great report sort of reviewing that omega-3 fats also increase the synthesis in the body, what are called resolvins. So this is a, maybe a new term for you, but there are these class D resolvents that are products of DHA and the class E resolvents are products of EPA. They have major inflammatory effects on the body. So here's how it works. The, the EPA, the eicosampantanoic acid from fish and fish oil, not only increases the production of an anti-inflammatory prostaglandins, it also increases the synthesis of what are called E resolvents, which have major anti-inflammatory effects. And DHA, which doesn't produce prostaglandins itself, does produce D resolvents, which also have anti-inflammatory effects. So the omega-3 fats have this incredible ability to modulate the inflammatory process, uh, including in immune cells to a significant degree. So this just goes on uh, talking about the role of fish oil and rheumatoid arthritic patients decreasing interleukin-1. In a clinical study in healthy volunteers, fish oil supplementation reduced tumor necrosis factor alpha. That's the receptor right on the monocyte when it gets stimulated. That's when you get the inflammatory cascade. It reduced interleukin-1. It decreased interleukin-6. 
uh, and it decreased uh, what's called endotoxin stimulated monocytes. So in other words, saturated fats stimulate this endotoxin type of effect on monocytes and they produce more inflammation. Omega-3 fats tone it down. So you see all these great effects on toning down uh, major inflammatory uh, features uh, in rheumatoid arthritis, including toning down nuclear factor, cap a, a nuclear uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-1 and interleukin-6. This is huge. They try to make drugs that can do this without side effects. The conclusion was in 2020 in the journal Rheumatology, it's not in some uh, you know prevention magazine. This is in the journal Rheumatology for rheumatologists to read. Omega-3 fatty acids are polyunsaturated fats which have an impact in health and disease. They act as precursors to lipid mediators of inflammation, and they may attenuate and modulate the autoimmune inflammatory response. They've been shown to ameliorate or prevent experimental arthritis and may decrease disease activity in rheumatoid arthritic patients. That's a huge statement to be putting into a rheumatology journal. Then with gamma linolenic acid from borash seed oil, 2001 study showed um, that it decreased tumor necrosis factor alpha in rheumatoid arthritic patients. And it also uh, uh, decreased the conversion of arachidonic acid into prostaglandin. That's exactly what you wanted to do. You wanted to, to take, you want to move that dihomo gamma linolenic acid over to prostaglandin series one and decrease the buildup of prostaglandin series two. And then the, the, the first early studies were really amazing on borash seed oil showing all of its clinical uh, benefits in groups that had uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, where they had a lot of you know, synovitis with a lot of very inflamed joints. So the gamma linolenic acid from borax you know, reduced the number of, of tender joints by 36%, the tender joint score by 45%, swollen joints by 28%, um, and, the joints, and the swollen joint score by 40%, whereas the placebo group did not show significant improvement. So this is a, a, a double blind study using uh, borax seed oil versus uh, placebo. The conclusion is a gamma linolenic acid. In doses used in this study is well tolerated and an effective treatment for active rheumatoid arthritis. So uh, you know, it's nice to have omega-3 fats from fish oil. Everybody knows that, but borax seed oil, borax seed oil has its own proven benefit. And in Austin, they don't, what's interesting is that you don't have a lot of, uh, you don't have any uh, human studies using these essential fatty acids for osteoarthritis because they go right to the more difficult type of arthritis, which is rheumatoid arthritis. But you do have experimental studies showing that omega-3 fats tone down uh, the inflammatory process in experimental studies. And here you see the Western diets are so high in the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. The only way to really even that out is to help improve, make dietary changes, but you're, you need to take supplements to actually get this ratio back to where it needs to be to reduce inflammation. This just reviews what you already know that the polyunsaturated fats uh, form these prostaglandins and resolvins and leukotrienes via these enzymes. And uh, in particular, prostaglandin series two is very uh, inflammatory and causes joint cartilage degradation by upregulating a certain thing. So this, they, took, they did this study with guinea pigs to, who made, they made them genetically predisposed to osteoarthritis. And they, they showed that omega-3 supplementation could actually pr help prevent this disease or slow it down. And it has the potential to reduce signs of osteoarthritic in both uh, cartilage and subchondral bone. So even in sort of experimental studies where you have animals that are bred there to actually have a lot of osteoarthritic changes, when you give them omega-3 fats, it prevents that process from occurring by toning down these effects. Once again, in my view, throughout all of adult life, people should be taking a supplement that, that looks like this. I take two or three capsules a day just for prevention. And then there are natural anti-inflammatory herbs that you likely know about, like curcumin and boswellia, white willow, like white willow extract and ginger, and they can further inhibit certain steps here, like curcumin can block the 5 and 12 lipoxygenase enzyme, boswellia and ginger can block the 5 lipoxygenase, uh, curcumin and white willow bark extract and ginger, they can help block the cyclooxygenase. So that becomes important. And when, we, when I do my next webinar in the future on autoimmune disease, I'll spend more time talking about curcumin and all its anti-inflammatory effects and boswellia and white willow bark extract 
And remember with white willow bark extract, there's uh, some precautions, children with race syndrome, also individuals with gout and hemophilia, active kidney disease, active ulcer, you don't wanna give it to these individuals. You can go through these slides afterwards and we'll send them to you. Also ginger has great anti-inflammatory effects. It's been shown to be helpful even in rheumatoid arthritis. So we also have this product at Adiva called Nature's Relief for more autoimmune type diseases and connective tissue disorders and bursitis and tendonitis. This is a great product, but where you have osteoarthritis, it's really more severe where just quercetin and bromelain and, uh, and um, MSM are not gonna be enough to tame it. In the short term, you might wanna add nature's relief. That's why I'm showing this to you today. But the overall approach that we want, we want for our osteoarthritic patients is to reduce the amount of arachidonic in their, bad, their body by decreasing the high animal meat products. And high fat dairy products contain fats that stimulate macrophages to release more inflammatory cytokines via a different pathway than prostaglandins, which we will see. You want to, here's the saturated fat story. Saturated fats carry into the bloodstream when they get absorbed, a lot of endotoxins from the gut that produce inflammatory cytokines to be released. And they also, um, so they bring this endotoxin load that's been shown to increase the C-reactive protein. This is not experimental, this is in humans now. So meat and cheese and high fat dairy products, they're problematic as well. They stimulate this toll-like four receptor on the macrophages which then upregulates a lot of inflammatory cytokines. So dairy products are a problem, but meat is also a problem to a lesser degree in this particular instance. So you might wanna read that fantastic review of this uh, published um, um, in 2015. You also want to get the right, you know, take a supplement that has the essential fatty acids that we're talking about here today. I happen to like the one that I formulated, of course, because um, it has fish oil, flax seed oil, and boracid oil at optimal amounts. And also the alcohol will screw it all up. Alcohol will promote more inflammatory prostaglandins to form. So will hydrogenated fat. So you need to minimize that. At the same time, take a high potency multivitamin like the Adiva all-in-one multi so you can get the antioxidants and the B50 complex and the magnesium and the zinc that you need to push the, the essential fatty acids towards the anti-inflammatory the anti prostaglandin. So the summary is basically this with osteoarthritic management. Of course, you want the person exercising. So they're stretching, they're strengthening, they're stabilizing their joints when they're able to do that, doing rhythmic exercise to break through some of the the fibrocytic nodules that they've built up and adhesions in the connective tissue, chiropractic mobilization and adjustments can be extremely helpful. As you know, you wanna break up the soft tissue adhesions, maybe electromodalities if you have them, electroacupuncture or acupuncture if you're using that. You want them on an anti-inflammatory diet, but you also need to be working on a cellular level giving them glucosamine with natural anti-inflammatory agents. I mean, it's just uh, the evidence suggests and supports that this is something that is a natural part of the therapy that needs to be used more. Same with essential fatty acid supplementation and also get those other nutrients into the body from a high potency multivitamin that will drive the prostaglandins towards the anti-inflammatory cascade. If they need more anti-inflammatory agents that are natural, you can look at a Diva Nature's Relief for the curcumin, boswellia, white willow bark extract and the ginger at the doses and standardized grades that have been shown to be effective. So once again, from a standpoint of using Adiva products, if you're using them, this is a glucosamine joint formula that has the glucosamine with the anti-inflammatory agents. This is sort of the dosage recommendations. These are the Health Canada approved claims. Here's nature's essential oils with the fish, flaxseed and borash seed oil. And here's the all-in-one multi that has those, anti, those antioxidants with the B50 complex, all the other nutrients to drive the pathway. This is what the full formulation looks like. You can see it's an incredible all-in-one formulation that saves the patient having to buy eight different vitamin products to get vitamin C and vitamin E and selenium and a B50 complex and calcium and vitamin D and, and buy you know, lutein and lycopene. It's all there in one formulation for them. And there's nature's relief with the uh, curcumin and boswellia and white willow bark and ginger. Of course, if they need to add this for a short period of time to really get the swelling down, it might be something to also consider. Just so you know, I take two capsules of these a day just for the anti-cancer properties. 
that they've been shown to have in terms of experimental studies and also curcumin in actual human studies. So I hope that was helpful for you. This is, uh, I really appreciate you attending today. I hope it was meaningful and uh, gave you a few little more clinical gems and makes you feel more confident with the science behind some of the biochemistry related to nutritional medicine as it affects osteoarthritis. So I really appreciate you coming and attending today and I hope to see you again next time.